Macron back the White House. As we reported, Presidents Trump and Macron were talking about Iran, Syria, North Korea, and trade. Now, with the May 12th deadline for renewing the Iran nuclear deal looming, President Trump seemed coy, mentioning his off-stated position, opposition to the agreement. Now, Trump hinted that he might keep an open mind, but he insisted he wants a better deal than the way it is currently structured right now. However, in pursuit of peace, we will not repeat the mistakes of past administrations. The campaign of maximum pressure will continue. France and the United States also agree that Iran cannot be allowed to develop a nuclear weapon, and that regime must end its support of terrorism. All over, nowhere, no matter where you go in the Middle East, you see the fingerprints of Iran behind problems. Yeah, here to discuss the significance of Macron's visit to the U.S. is David Troyansky. He's a history professor at Brooklyn College who focuses on French history. Welcome, Professor. Thank you. So when we look at this particular visit, did it have to be France? Like, what's the significance of France coming here now? Well, a couple of things. One is there's a very old bilateral relationship between the United States and France. France is the oldest ally of the United States. We can go back to uh, the fact that you've got two... Uh, revolutionary republics in the 18th century that are friends right from the start. Uh, there have been some rocky times uh, in the last couple of hundred years, but generally it's been a good relationship. So in part, it's about the centrality of that relationship. But there's also the fact that Macron, in many ways, is speaking not just for France, but for Europe. Mm. And uh, that makes it that much more important. So what does he hope to gain? Um, I think we can answer that at a couple of levels. One is he wants to assert the importance of France, both with respect to the United States and with respect to other European countries. Um, the other is there are particular things he'd like, and I think you, you've mentioned some of them. Uh, one is the maintenance of the Iran deal. Uh, where I think he's certainly speaking for more than just France. Mm. Um, another has to do with uh, figuring out where um, uh, these powers go forward on Syria. Uh, another has to do with trade issues. Um, you might have thought that he would have said a little bit more about the environment, but I think maybe aside from planting a tree on the White House grounds, <laughs> uh, there's not much hope of, uh, uh, of much there, at least at the moment. But he plays the central role now in Europe. When we look at France, we also have to think about what the United States wants from that country. What does Trump want, specifically from France? That's a tougher question. Um, I think, uh, in general, Trump, I mean, people say Trump wants to be liked, Trump wants to appear maybe presidential, and he wants to assert a kind of uh, uh, authority or dominance. Um, but I, I, I think he also, may recognize the role that France is playing in Europe. And he realizes that this is the one leader that he seems to be comfortable talking with mm. about these issues. When we look at you know, Macron's role in France, he's a little bit of a controversial figure right now. He's facing his own challenges. Can you explain what challenges he's facing that might impact his ability to come to any sorts of agreement with the United States? Yeah, sure. Um, he, he came to power asserting that he was a different kind of politician and that he represented something that he and a few other people had referred to as the radical center, which meant freezing out far right, mm -hmm. as in Le Pen, and the far left. Um, and he, he's sort of engaged in a balancing act. And right now he's facing rolling strikes uh, among the railroad workers. Um, there are students who are on strike who are occupying university campuses. Um, these are things that are real challenges. In general, he's wanted to change the labor laws, and uh, there are a lot of people who see that as a challenge to the traditional French sort of social uh, compact. 
You keep on mentioning that you know, Macron holds an extraordinary position right now in Europe, but what about Germany? I mean, it's not a, a force to dismiss right now. No, um, but the, uh, the problem is uh, that uh, when uh, Angela Merkel um, came out of the last election, she was greatly weakened. Mm. And so she's got to deal with partners in Germany um, who uh, really don't want to deal very much with Trump, and she's got to answer to them. Uh, I think um, the fact that Macron came out of his election a bit stronger made that uh, uh, made him a better candidate. Also, uh, it's possible that the relations between these human beings matter, <laughs> and it seems that the relationship between Trump and uh, uh, Merkel is uh, is a bit colder. Uh, well, we see images of you know the French president kissing uh, Trump on the cheeks, which is sort of or nice. At least whispering, yeah, well, yeah whispering. Yeah, he did that too. That's right. That's right. That's so, right. Is, do you think it's a true relationship, or do you think it's all just for show? Oh, I think that's very hard to answer. Um, Do you I, not want to kiss him on the cheek? No, no, no. <laughs> I'll, I'll dodge that one. Uh, but it seems to me that each one has something to gain. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of people in the press around the world who think that basically Macron has figured out how to uh, work Trump. Mm. Um, I, I'm not sure if we see the same thing in the other uh, direction. But, I mean, perhaps what they say about their friendship is true, uh, but interests matter. Uh, and I think they're using this, um, the sort of image of friendship, the gestures of friendship, as a way of trying to accomplish something. And, you know, in the history of diplomacy, it, it sometimes has helped to have a good relationship with, uh, uh, with a partner or uh, antagonist. What about this whole notion of a common target? And we, we look at the Iran nuclear deal. Could that be a force that draws the United States and France ever tighter? That's a really tough one, and we'll know a lot more maybe in the next couple of weeks, maybe not. Um, I think uh, Macron, in many ways, is speaking for his fellow Europeans. And to some extent, I think, I mean, he knows what the other partners in that agreement uh, are interested in. Um, and so he's speaking for more than just France, uh, but he's also asserting the importance of France. Um, what Macron did today was to try and reframe the issue. And maybe that'll have an important impact. Basically, he recognized that it's difficult to change Donald Trump's mind, but it may be possible to reframe the issue to add uh, elements to the existing agreement. Well, Macron also wants the U.S. to exempt European uh, imports of these tariffs. Do you think that's likely at all? I mean, is that a chip that Trump is likely to give up to France? The reports that I've heard uh, are that that might work for a while. Um, for a while, because yeah. you're prefacing that, for a while. Yes, 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 yes. But the thing is, Fra I mean, despite what Trump said about uh, liking uh, to negotiate one-on-one, -on -one, he can't just do that because of Europe. So there's a way in which Macron is trying to balance being the president of a sovereign nation and being the one who finds himself in a position um, to speak for Europe and then maybe to be in the position of having to convince Europeans and others uh, that they should go along with some kind of compromise with Trump. And it, it's hard to tell exactly what's going to happen. And there's also Iran itself. Thank you so much for coming here to explain a very complex issue right now. David Troyansky, history professor at Brooklyn College. Thank you.